Greetings are from the heart of Kampala broadcasting to you live. This is Church of Uganda Family TV and you are watching the Family Hour. Thank you so much for choosing Church of Uganda Family TV. This is a Family Hour Empowering Families, one episode at a time. Now, this is our Thursday edition, which is so, so special, where we talk about leadership and governance. So, today we are still having an interesting topic that you shouldn't miss out. And I believe by the time we end this session, a lot uh, will have changed in your mind, especially uh, when we look at the way we look at our leadership and interpret certain things. Today we are looking at the dynamics uh, at workplace and uh, of course there are a lot of dynamics. Last time we were talking about the politics and uh, of course there is someone who made a comment that was so interesting about politics that now I realize we just need to sit into the politics and enjoy it <laughs> but you can't run away from it uh, that was really really very interesting but uh Edwin Austin Colors is my name and you have our team ready of course uh, Dr Patricia is already here with us Dr it's a pleasure having you this evening thank you very much Edwin and good evening viewers uh, thank you so much then it's a pleasure having you as well. Thank you. It's nice to be here as always. Good evening, viewers. Good evening uh, to you all. This is um, a very interesting topic. Uh, when we talk about <coughs> the different dynamics, uh, like I started with uh, a response from last week's discussion where someone said, now I realize we, sh uh, we should just learn how to sit in the politics. You sit comfortably <laughs> in the politics. <laughs> But of course, we have very many other dynamics uh, at, at, our, at our workplace. At least each workplace has their own way, and uh, uh, they have their own politics, if I can put it like that. And they have different things that happen there, which might not be related to the other workplace. Uh, so let us uh, kick off with now the boss versus leader dynamics. Dr. Patricia, we are looking at now the boss who is a boss and who is a leader and um, of the two who do we need in leadership i think we need more of a leader okay. than the boss simply because a leader understands the significance of inspiring others and working through teams a leader is that person who can get results quickly through inspiring others giving them motivation encouraging them producing results. A boss is always rigged with power and influence. So you find that a boss may even re re resist change in organizations and want to be that person who goes by his or her own direction. And it is very, very hard for a boss to get people produce very good results because of the rigid nature of the leadership. So a dynamic leader is that a person who basically knows the advantages or the significance of inspiring teams and building them and encouraging them and getting the best out of people. Then the boss looks more about themselves. Okay. Uh, they're self-centered. They look at how they can get results through using their power, through using uh, authority. So they are authoritative as well. That's what I would say about the, the two. Yeah. Then, uh, all people start as leaders. Who graduates them to bosses? <laughs> <laughs> I do wish everyone started as a leader, but mm. leadership in itself is influence. Mm. Mm. If anybody anybody can influence, but you, but you see, uh, your level of influence goes on increasing with the amount of knowledge that you have. Uh -huh. So you become a better leader based on the fact that you're able to master your sphere of influence. Today, I am at, I think, level one, level two, level three leadership with different people. Some people at level five leadership with different people. I like the Maxwell book on leadership because it shows you what a leader can be. And at every level you are at, at, at every time, you're at a different level of leadership. So leadership in itself is really about influence and you grow, you grow into becoming the best leader that you can become. Becoming a boss is, um, 
is one both the way you have looked at looked at certain things looking at certain people and also i must say many of us who are cholerics mm. uh but that character trait it's it, it comes natural to be a boss we mm. have to learn to be leaders and and i said that because i know it's going to be contested we when we talk about the cholerics they say we are natural born leaders but we can also be because of the nature of being a choleric you are very assertive you can be very aggressive you are a go to you are goal oriented person so many times we'll crush people along the way to get to the goal and i i know because i've i've been that person for a long time uh i i i used to sacrifice people for the end <laughs> i used to sacrifice people to get to the end because you're very goal oriented the goal matters more mm-hmm. than the process you always ask the question uh does 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 the end justify the means and my answer was always if i like the means if i like the end then it doesn't matter what happened in the means a leader on the other hand cares a <coughs> lot about the process that leads to the goal mm-hmm. and um it's it's very good for especially us who are cholerics to learn to be leaders and not bosses because it comes naturally to you you naturally rise to the top you naturally take charge you naturally have a solution you are doing things as fast as possible because you have an end in mind but what we need always need to learn is the process to matters people to matter and that's where the leader comes in because a leader desires to influence and their ability to influence will come in in how they work with people work with circumstances look at the end but also know that even in their sacrificing they are sacrificing to build rather than to take down uh mm. so i think for me that's that's the, that's the really the difference but I, i i default to the fact that character traits i think are more likely to be <laughs> caught off when it comes to <laughs> becoming a boss uh, yes. because i i know i know it very well i've been there i've tested it <laughs> Uh, have you come out? Yes, I think I oh, I, I had no I had the I had the beauty of having mentors. Okay. Uh mentors who were able to tell me the truth but also to read a lot of books. When I began to read books, some of my friends couldn't say certain things to me. And so they gave me a book to read. And when I discovered that book and I realized what they were saying to me without saying it to me. I realized at thankfully that's before I left school. Mm-hmm. Uh because I during school you have so many opportunities to to what you call lead. And in all those opportunities I was reflecting boss tendency. But when they gave me that book right before I left school, it opened my mind to the difference between uh, being a boss and being a leader and then I desired more to be a leader. So now I truly care about the people through the process. I and mean, it's more you find that you have less work when you start to care about people. Uh-huh. <laughs> As if you tell you want to so, do I don't that. I am just imagining mm. Diana with authority. <laughs> and control <laughs> and then this book helps her understand that hey wait a moment i think i need to begin caring more about, about people, people yeah. without minding about controlling them or having authority over them but you realize that over time the traditional concept of uh, of boss is changing it is gradually giving way to more effective and inspiring uh, approach known as leadership and the examples Diana has given over time a human being is subject to change of mind also especially when you get mentored or nurtured or inspired then you you change your mindset and even the way you do things and become a better a better leader but both terms these yeah. days are used interchangeably i yeah. say oh my boss yes. but there is a distinctive style of management yeah. which a leader uses when hand- handling their tasks or their responsibilities compared to that of a boss like what Diana says inspiration and vision a boss may look at the short term tasks say i want this done i want it done in this way but a leader will look at completing and compelling this vision for the future so a leader is futuristic while a boss is looking at the immediate mm-hmm. then when it comes to communication and even collaboration a boss will look at the top down method and approach he or she communicates from the top and it should degenerate to the bottom but a leader will look at that transparent dialogue and encourages feedback from everybody else 
and that is the difference, a very clear difference. Mm -hmm. Then in terms of coaching and development, mm -hmm. I agree 100% with Diana when she says, you now think more about people. Because a boss will look at task delegation, will look at performance evaluation, will set targets and say, you, Edwin, you're responsible for A, B, C, D, and if they're not done, then you, you will be answerable. But a leader will look at coaching with a view of changing the mindset. A leader will look at growth and development. A leader will look at the opportunity to make this person a better employee in an organization. Then in terms of trust and empowerment, again, there is a clear distinction between the two. Because most bosses look at macro uh, micromanagement. Mm. They want to manage everything as the boss. But leaders will trust teams and that is why Diana says work will become so easy because as a leader you'll be able to delegate and say this one will handle this task, this one will cont contribute to it in this way and so you encourage teamwork and you produce more results when you actually use uh, uh, teams. So you find the leader inspires, a leader empowers, a leader drives meaningful change in institutions because of that approach. But when people are bossy, it's about power, it's about authority, it's about having control. Now you can't have control when people don't believe in you. But when you're a leader and you use these approaches, then even the people you are using, you're, you're leading will begin to believe in you and will trust you and will feel needed and wanted in that organization and will produce results just because of the approach you are using in your leadership uh, skills. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Diana, you, you say one of the things that helped you uh, change was uh, the mentors, but also the reading. So uh, I look at someone who is being mentored by a boss. <laughs> and they really being mentored. The person who comes a boss then, they are training him. Because uh, I, I think I want us to understand, because a boss has really become so common. Yes. My boss, my boss, mm. my boss. Now, and, and actually, uh, thank you for giving us at least the distinct uh, features of a boss and a leader. So at least someone might, um, can now know that this one is really a boss, but in a uh, boss that has a title but in them is a leader now how important is mentorship especially when it comes to grooming a leader that's a very good question how important is mentorship um one when you when you choose to mentor you're trying to get the best out of somebody and so whatever you show them and and, and profile for them or expose to, or expose them to they will become and as a mentor, as a mentor, somebody who's mentoring somebody, especially in leadership, because I believe every, every leader should mentor, otherwise you are not doing anything as a leader. But I think that you are showing them how best they can lead. You're showing them the pitfalls it happens. You're showing them the difference between being a boss and being a leader. And so you have the opportunity to expose them to different styles, you have the opportunity to expose them to different repercussions from the styles. You have the opportunity to expose them to different consequences that arise. And if you are open enough and secure enough, you can show them that I started out in this way and it did not work. I have done this and this method and it did not work. And then if you expose them to that, you develop them as leaders and you show them that it's better to lead in this facet and this particular fashion. Uh, to your first statement, you know when people say my boss, my boss, it's a nuance people are using today. Yeah. They don't necessarily mean it in a sense that uh, somebody is being bossy over them. Because you now see cups that say boss lady, boss mm, chick, exactly. uh, boss. Those are nuances that the, the dictionary is bringing out to show to show authority, to show leadership, like she has said, like Dr. Patricia has said, it's it's an interchange of the word, but in its intrinsic definition, or in its particular and very, very definition, we you 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 don't like having a boss because at the end of the day, you're not developing as a person, and that's where mentorship comes in. You're you are not developing either in either your character or your career 
or generally in, 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 in the society that you're in. Because mentorship is important in developing character-wise. And so that, that would help you. It's also important in developing your career for those who are looking for mentorship in career. And career could be white, could even be in ministry if that's a career that you're choosing. It could be as a mother, that could be a stay-at-home mother, could be a career. So I'm not talking about it in the sense that it's a profession, mm. but in the sense that developing the kind of person you are intended to become. And then, of course, it's important in developing your community because each of us wants to be relevant to our community. We want to be mm. relevant mm. to the nation, hopefully. We want to be relevant. And that's why people join clubs that promote them into that help them feel like there's, there's some value to their life. And so mentorship is important because it develops character, it develops, uh, it develops the person's career, but it also develops the community. And helping, if you model to a person what leadership looks like in all those different facets, you're doing a good job. But if you show them that uh, when things get tough, uh, bulldoze your way through, <laughs> you're also showing them that this is the kind of thing that works. And the society we are living in now is changing and changing. Uh, you have sadly a generation that is extremely um, aggressive, mm -hmm. especially in us as a country. <coughs> We're extremely aggressive. And what, what I see a lot of people modeling to them is being a boss. Because the truth is, we are, we are questioning the kind of leadership we have had. We're questioning the kind of leadership, whether it is family, whether it's uh, locality, LC, whether it is uh, district, whether it goes up. We're questioning it because that has been portrayed to us as leadership. And so most people have defaulted uh, to become uh, aggressive and to order, and to order a lot of institutions they have been given. So they're defaulting to the boss mentality because they don't like what has been modeled to them. And yet what we want to do is tell people, you can model good leadership so that people can aspire to it. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patricia. Before we get into another dynamic, we, we want to now uh, conclude this aspect of mentoring leaders instead of bosses. Uh, for me, I think, uh, first of all, before we get into mentoring mm. leaders, it is important for us to understand more about the people, people management. Mm. Are we able to make people move to the direction we want them to go as a leader? Are we able to, to motivate them to get the best out of them? So you find that motivating would help people move to the direction you want them to go to as, as a leader. And also, motivated people usually do work willingly, enthusiastically, and also they, they, they achieve results without necessarily pushing them as the bosses do, because they are motivated. So in order to succeed, <clears throat> I think it's important for us, first of all, to know to understand the process of having to keep a motivated team uh, with you, the concept of motivation and the implications of, of motivation. Because do you know that even when you have a team who feel they are valued, they are needed, they are wanted in an organization, they have the ability to go the extra mile and produce uh, outputs. So it is important, first of all, for people to know the expectations of their employers on them, and then also the employer's expectations on the employee. Usually we want the values of the organization to be uplifted, we want people to produce results, we want hardworking people, we want the best results from the organization. But as leaders, we need to also think about what the employees think about us who are leading them. The employees want to be treated humanely. They want their rights to be taken into consideration, the terms and, and, and conditions of, of service, the environment. They need to be motivated. They need to be valued. They need to fe feel that they contribute to the organization. So in order to have that motivated team, it takes us to the question you are bringing out on mentorship. Yes. How do we mentor people to be able to produce the results we expect from them. It is essential to raise others to a high level. Even when we, 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 we feel uh, uh, 
they are even getting better better than us we we, we should feel very satis satisfied when, when when that happens so it is very important for us to to encourage growth and you encourage growth by modeling a character you want others to become and that is what i i for me i would look at mentoring because i see people who are truly successful out there um they raise others up and they don't feel threatened even when those people get to levels even higher than themselves who are the mentors actually the praises all go to the mentor they are you know growing and, and and striving for potential they don't get worried at all on 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 whether they are being praised or recognized but they are looking at contributing positively to the organization so i think mentorship plays a very significant part in the lives of people but there are people who do not want to mentor others for some reasons because one there are issues to do security two there is ego they feel that they are going to be challenged by the people they are mentoring and they have to protect protect that then there are others who do not have the ability they don't have the ability to to disarm potential or skill or a seed of success in somebody and yet people out there all have potential it's just about mentoring them training them and bringing out that potential just like you see a, a little baby when it is the time for learning how to walk is falling down getting up falling down but the moment he gets on his feet and gets the stability and he can walk he is all over the place same to human beings when you mentor them, when you train them, when you groom them, when you nurture them, they get to a level where the sky is the limit. They will not slow down. They will, you will just see results coming out. So if we all took that attitude as leaders and then choose to mentor the people, choose to get the best out of the people, motivate them, encourage them, inspire them, then I think we would be very, very successful as a country if leaders took that, that, that path because you, you, sometimes we have the ability to uh, ability to, to, to discern or identify potential in people. If you identify potential, bring it out, encourage that person to grow. Because once you find that seed, you need to fertilize it with encouragement, you need to water it with opportunity, you need to help this person come out and be also a leader or even a better leader than you. So there are certain wrong concepts people have because you know true success is about first of all knowing what your purpose is as a leader, growing to reach your maximum potential and even sowing sowing the seeds to of success to benefit other people and you sow the seeds of success to benefit other people by mentoring them pulling their hand and say, come on, I know you can do this. I know you can handle this task. I know you can go the extra mile. I know we can achieve this together. So I think that is very, very important. And it acts also like a training ground, a training ground to equip people with skills, with knowledge, with abilities to be able to, to carry out the, the different tasks. And that is what leaders do compared to what the bosses do. The boss will just give instructions. Be in office by eight. I want this done, I want this done. But how you do it, the boss will not have time for, for that. So it is the leader who goes the extra mile and says, no, 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 no. I think I need to get the best out of this person and it begins the journey of mentorship. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Patricia. We are taking a short commercial break. And when we return, we are going to continue with a very interesting dynamic that we do not have to miss. Please stick with us. Uh, thank you so much. If we're still watching. This is a family hour. That's the edition. This is a special edition dedicated to all leaders because we are looking at leadership and governance. Today, we are looking at the various dynamics. Now, just in case you're just joining us for the first time uh, for this Thursday edition, and this is the part you're watching first. Uh, we are looking at the dynamics, and before the break, we are looking at boss versus leader, and I believe you who has followed through, you can now sit back and reflect on your ways and now uh, judge yourself. Am I really a boss or a leader at work? Uh, but we are continuing with the dynamics. We are with uh, Dr. Patricia, uh, the deputy IGG, and we also have Diana, 
who is a chancellor, Diocese of Kampala. We are now going to look at something so sensitive, but very important, uh, especially at a time where people have started eyeing 2026. <laughs> <laughs> people have started uh, uh, foreseeing uh, 2026, and of course we are seeing a lot of talks and what. But we want to get a guest uh, out of this discussion. Uh, we are, I want to look at now dictatorship versus democracy. Just to understand the two terms and the beauty in uh, what we take as the best option. Dr. Patricia, I will start with you. For me, <laughs> I look at uh, dictatorship mm -hmm. and, uh, and democracy as the two distinct leadership structures mm -hmm. that basically affects uh, the citizen mm -hmm. of a state or a country. One, because democracy, first of all, allows people to make choices make choices of how they want to be led, who they want to lead them. And uh, dictators do not allow, he chooses to be the supreme leader, he chooses to, to make all the decisions on behalf of the people. Growing up, we were talk, taught that democracy is a government by the people, for the people, uh, for the people. Government for the people, by the people, and for the people. For the people. Mm. So you find that democracy, we see the rule by the people, where people are involved in making decisions that affect their day-to-day -day lives and well-being, making decisions on the programs and projects they think would suit them in the community. But on a dictatorship, it is just the leader who makes a decision on behalf of the people. So I think for me that is how I, I, I look at it. Going to 2026, I think it's time for leaders to think what is best for them. Do they want to be democratic? Do they want to be dictatorship? In a dictatorship kind of a, arrangement, normally many would opt for the democracy. But when you see lots of things falling apart, when you see a lot of impunity, people no longer respecting the rule of law, if you look at the kind of cases we are dealing with today, you would wonder that this person really have common sense. Is it just impunity? Is it that they have just lost it and are no longer patriotic and no longer think about this thing of uh, or Uganda mm. for all of us? So I think uh, we, we may think um, that way, but I think taking the conversation far, I think uh, I would like to hear from my sister, my sister Diana. On I don't know why Diana is already <laughs> laughing, but I think she said imagine, that one. I imagine she's agreeing with me quite. Things are going out of hand. When you say tell for pass this way, they are going the opposite direction. Mm. The law is saying let's follow this direction. They are in breach all the time. <laughs> You've given someone resources to take care for the common good of the people for national development, mm. service delivery. The person has walloped it all and pocketed yeah. it and yeah. taken. Yeah. Then what do we call such a person? Yes. Dictatorship <laughs> versus democracy. <laughs> you know, that's a dangerous topic in this country. But um, I don't know if we can achieve a balance of both. Mm. I'm, I'm, I've always struggled to achieve a balance of both. Um, I, 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 it's, it's hard because you don't know you don't know what will produce the kind of results. Every growing uh, country is in a different stage of, of development. Uganda is 50, how long? 50? 1962 to now. Uh, so we are, we're just a budding nation, <coughs> I say. And the tenets of democracy itself are really known to us, a recognition of the fun fundamental worth and dignity of every person the respect for equality of all persons. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. uh, a faith in majority rule, an insistence upon minority rights, an acceptance of the necessity of compromise. So they're, they're tenets of democracy, the things we speak about that are so obvious, separation of powers, these different things. But really, as, as it's, it's the government uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In its, does it really work in its intrinsic nature? Does that really come? Is the government really of the people, by the people, and for the people? 
Is there any country, even as far as back as 100 years old, that has achieved that? Those are questions that we should be asking ourselves. What does a true democracy look like? A people, is the government truly by the people? Is it of the people? Is it for the people? Is it pro the people? Is it developing the, the kind of services that you want to see? And if you compare America, which is the sort of called the, the democracy, uh, depending on who you ask also, okay. uh, with other countries that you call a uh, much more much more leaning towards a, a, a dictatorship the the level of development uh really 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 differs yeah it differs i've seen uh places that you've called absolute dictatorships and the development is fantastic i've seen places you've called democracies and the development is fantastic you've also seen both in what you call a shadow democracy you've seen what the service delivery looks like you've also seen a dictatorship and seen what it looks like so is it really about the style of leadership or is it about who is leading and that's where we find ourselves is it really about them or is it about who is leading because intrinsically we, we, we have been taught in school to advocate for a democracy but we have seen both sides and what it looks like and so for me it comes down less about whether it's democracy or dictatorship but about do we have good leaders whose heart is truly for development <coughs> of the country okay. and before i still <laughs> leave you because dr patricia bounced it on you. Uh, we are looking at, uh, you've talked about the tenets of democracy and uh, of course you brought in something uh, important that at, uh, at so a certain point it ceases to be democracy or dictatorship but who exactly that um, so I look at uh, if like Dr. Patricia said earlier that uh, sometimes dictatorship is better. Uh, I look at a situation where a leader, a dictator for the good of the nation might come up with something which is good for him mm. and not good for the rest but because it is dictatorial and no democracy uh, uh, doesn't it isn't this uh, a little harmful to the people you lead especially if you are now becoming a dictator especially if maybe you want to put right certain things that you think are amiss mm. and uh, so you think i will not have to base on anyone whatever i think will do, will do <laughs> is what i exact on to <laughs> the in its, in its in is it in its intrinsic nature mm. a dictatorship where people don't have a heart for the country is going to destroy everyone it's going to destroy the leader it's going to destroy the systems it's going to destroy the country mm. and it's it just basic nature it because the moment you remove certain things such as human rights mm. and the mm. rights of the people, mm. you are going to destroy it. Now, it can only last for a certain time. I mean, history has taught us dictatorship can only last for a certain time. <laughs> when it actually goes, there is more harm that you have caused mm. than actual good. But again, back to my point, if you find somebody whose heart, they, their style may be wrong, but whose heart is for the country and developing the country. They will really think of themselves as a way to benefit from this. They will think of, uh, fine, we may not, we may, we may, we may, um, I'm trying not to use obvious examples. <laughs> I'm really trying not to use obvious examples. But you, if you, for example, find uh, you have put someone in a position that they have not earned, yeah? Say we appoint a minister and they, they don't have the paperwork, they don't have that, and you, you find that, uh, that, that the person's not suitable, fire them immediately, mm -hmm. right? If you, but that, that, because it's the prerogative of the, different countries, it's the prerogative of the president to appoint or disappoint. Okay. And if, for example, you find that uh, there's been corruption in a certain place, and you don't go through the set mechanisms which involve court and proving and doing all those things, giving a person a fair hearing, uh, or, for example, the court systems, you say, my court systems don't work. I have become the judge and the jury. Now, execute that person. Now, you begin to create an atmosphere of fear, an atmosphere that people cannot survive in. And so it, 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 it's, it's a detriment <coughs> to the person because investors can't come into the country. Uh, things that would help 
the nation in terms of investment. Tourism can't come into the country. You're actually on a red light list somewhere. Mm -hmm. Your country is not open for different people. You are doing more harm than good. But if you have a heart for the people and you respect fundamental human rights and you have processes that are clear, and yet you are still a bit tight on certain things, that for me is something I think that is worth discussing. Rather than us saying, people are the ones that decide. People are the ones that do. If people say, no, we don't want this, let's do what we want. That impunity that Dr. Bush is speaking mm -hmm. about is what breeds in the people. And at the end, it's also a detriment to the people. So it comes down for me as a person, it comes down to me as a constitutional lawyer. It comes down to me, uh, it comes down to st whatever style you pick, it matters who is at the top. Okay. And there was silence. Dr. <laughs> 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 Patricia, what do you consider as good dictatorship? For me, mm. if a leader thinks in terms of the common good of the citizens, the common good, what would be the common good for everybody? Thinks in terms of governance, good governance. Good governance, the, the authoritative expression of the state in governance, and look at what the benchmarks are of governance. Is there a rule of law? Are people able to follow or obey the principles or policies that are in place? Can they be kept on check? Anyone in breach can be punished according to the provisions of the law? Does it apply equally on everybody else? And then accountability. Accountability not only for money, but for all the resources, both human, financial, and other resources we have in this country. If that leader is able to promote those, if that leader is able to uphold the rights of people, mm. you know, a human being is born in dignity, yeah. in dignity and needs to be taken care of in that aspect. His rights, the right to food, health, economic, social, cultural rights, and so on. Can they access education? Can they accept, access clean water and sanitation and so on? Is there political pluralism where people are free to come out and belong to parties and also participate? Because remember, the political parties are like watchdogs and check on, on, the, on the existing government. So for me, if that person comes out and is a dictator, chooses to be the supreme authority and makes decisions on behalf of the people, decisions that are for the common good, common good that cut across, and everybody is agreeable to that, I think for me it would work. Then saying, well, we, we, we can make contributions, you can consult. The people need to be consulted with to make decisions which affect them. The people are free to express themselves. The people, we have seen the people now getting to levels of impunity, and even abusing the rights they have been, what? Given. given to enjoy as freely as Ugandans. Of course, it will have negative impact. Then we can go back to the drawing board and say, hey, Uganda as a country, we need to reorganize our laws, our policies, our systems, our structures, our institutions, and so on. Then put aside some of this and say, well, I think I need this to be in this direction. I need orderliness here. I need because we have got the institutions, we have got the legal and policy framework, we have got, but things are going out of hand. What medicine do we need as Ugandans to, to cure that? So for me, I think we need to go to the drawing board and think about a test of if someone can take decisions for the common good, common good, because even then, when you go into consultations, doesn't it take time? <laughs> it takes time. Yes. So if we want a fundamental change in this country, mm. now is the time. To, to, think, <laughs> to think, I know this conversation can be taken further, and I know there are categories of Ugandans who will agree mm. and say, I think we need a test of this, just for purposes of improving the state of affairs mm. in our country. Because if we surely love this country, if we are ready to be patriotic, 
for purposes of improving this country, then we need to we need to think about clear, workable things that can can take us somewhere. Because Adrian, for me on day to day basis, I sanction cases of corruption, mm. and I see the genesis of how it happens. I see, I can trace money from somebody's account to where he put it, where he stole it from, where he took it after stealing and so on. And you see and say, hey, is this really possible? And the person will cover his back. Eh? And some people even use the law. They circumvent the law in order to get themselves out. Then surely, it has become next to impossible to prove a bribe. Yeah. A bribe. Someone can send mobile money or wire it on somebody's nephew's account or houseboy's account. Then how, how are we going to deal with it? The people who report cases of bribery are people who are people whose deals have gone sour. They were part of the thing. And then because they didn't get part of the baguette, they now come and say, I'm now a whistleblower. I think so, so surely this country, I think we need to do something about this. We need to find medicine, medicine to treat some of these shortfalls we have. And we are not lamenting, but we are thinking about workable solutions. solutions. <laughs> Another workable solution uh -huh. yes. would be, I think, uh, institutions. How do we strengthen institutions to work? Uh -huh. uh, for, it, for, I think for me that's the biggest antidote to what we are seeing in this country. Can we strengthen institutions to work? If they did their job today mm -hmm. and court did its job the way court is supposed to do its job, I think we'd have less people crying. If we strengthened uh, Every, every every watchdog, you know, institution, mm -hmm. IGG today, if we strengthen parliament today, if we say a journalist today, the media, the fourth estate, if we strengthen all these institutions, it will be an antidote to all the things that we are crying about. Mm -hmm. And so it for me, it just goes back in the end to what can we do? Is it really one versus the other? Is it that you can use one to cure the other? Because I have found that when you start off on one, you can't, you can choose it, but you can't choose the consequences. Mm -hmm. And that for me is the biggest fear. The fact that we can't choose the consequences. Today we admire certain countries, but should it fall apart, we know that we are all good. Everything is, everything you have worked for is going to fall apart. And so I think what we do need as a country is institutional strength. I don't know how, but we need to strengthen institutions. And that will start with good leaders in those places and mm -hmm. leaders in those places. If we need bosses, then maybe we should take bosses <laughs> there to strengthen them. Well, uh, thank you so much for that. When you, you talked about uh, uh, strengthening institutions, you reminded me of uh, a discussion uh, that was here where after the biannual report was handed over to, to, the, to parliament by the IG. IDG, and someone said, okay, the idea has highlighted police and uh, local governments, but what happens after that? <laughs> but that is a talk for another time. <laughs> well, you have no? only the IDG. Uh, how will I have only the well, IDG? Well, <laughs> I can say something. I can say something briefly mm. about that. Mm. Police and local government are the closest institutions mm. to the people. Mm. Being close to the people, they are the ones answering most of these cases. Mm crime happening out there, local government in terms of service delivery. So naturally, they're always at the top because most of the complaints we have come from the people. Mm -hmm. But there can be mechanisms in place to improve on how they do their work. Okay, the issue mm -hmm. was, okay, after highlighting them, mm -hmm. and what other efforts are done to see that this is, is limited? So that next time, okay, when the IG submits its report mm. to Parliament, mm. being the oversight institution mm. in the country, Parliament then calls the responsible institutions and put them to task to explain. Mm. Police will say, "Well, we have got the professional standards unit, we have the anti-corruption unit, we have this, but we can do a little more mm. to improve on these issues of the traffic people who take bribes by the roadside or people who ask for tips and so on and so forth." Because they are just those actions which mess or tarnish the image of the institution. Mm -hmm. So like uh, Diana has said, there should be a deliberate action mm -hmm. to ensure that institutions are able mm -hmm. to work and work and uphold the different mandates they have. 
when institutions begin working, I think the people, the citizens will feel that something is happening. But the citizens are crying mm -hmm. and saying there's a problem in the institutions. They're saying the institutions are all, all corrupt. Recently, <laughs> I, was, I was, I think, on, on radio. They said, even your institution, <laughs> each time we report a case before the person reaches downstairs, the person he has reported already knows. No, now, Doctor Patricia, so, that brings us to this discussion. Which mm -hmm. sectors um, yeah. in Uganda do you think need the greatest leaders? For me, I think the education, because we have hope on the young people. The majority of the population we have in the country are the young people. So the greatest leaders should be in that sector. Because, like I said, we have hope. We can mentor them. We can train them. We can do the, the, the integrity campaign. We can instill values in them. We can do mindset change. There is a lot we can do with the young people because they are full of energy and willing to learn and they're dynamic. But the, the, the generation, I don't know whether it's our generation or the ones above Not ours. <laughs> <laughs> Leaves a big question mark. Mm. Leaves a big question mark. But the young people, I think those are the people who need those very, very good leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there's a, 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 an age group that is just up there to fight and challenge everything that comes up. But at least the young people, you can talk to them, you can do the mindset change, you can talk about values and PISA, accountability, honesty, integrity, and they will, it will sink in. But now if you start that with the, the other generation, I don't want to say. <laughs> but of course it is known. <laughs> yeah. So that known generation, it is a bit problematic. Okay. Yes. Then, which <coughs> sectors do you look out for? Uh, for greatest leadership? Three. Mm. Education, mm. infrastructure, mm. investment. Mm -hmm. Education goes without saying. I think COVID mm. showed us that two years spending, two years of people spending their time at home mm. killed more people than you realized. You saw a rise in teenage pregnancy, yeah. you mm. saw mm. abuse, yeah. you saw a rise in border borders yeah. on the street, mm -hmm. you saw a rise in so many things. And its repercussions are still being felt, and unfortunately, they will be felt for a long time to come. We need to change the curriculum on what we are doing. I mean, I studied about Car Canadian prairies. I, I haven't been to Canada. I don't know <laughs> anything about Canadian prairies. We need to change the curriculum to make it more suitable to the actual reality we have as a country. Mm -hmm. Because we are training people in things that are just head knowledge. Why don't we train them in things that are practical, that will help them, to become, first of all, employable, valuable, and things that can help them. And so for me, if we touch the education sector from the lowest level, we are changing the, 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 the face of this country. Mm. Infrastructure, without a doubt, I am, I'm crying about my shock absorbers. I, I, really, I, I really need, something has got to change. Our roads have got to change. Our transport system has got to change. The railways, the airport, the, I mean the airlines, all infrastructure, buildings, all those things. Let's look like we got independence in 1962. <laughs> I drove through a road the other time and I said, if a white person comes here, they'll say this road was last repaired in 1962. That's how bad our infrastructure is. Something has got to be done. We are a country that suffers from, uh, I don't want to say terrible weather, because I think we have the best weather in yeah. every in, in the world. Sure. We have the best weather. But we are going more and more into rainy seasons and bad rain. And so what can we do to ensure that when it rains, we are not, we don't, there are no swamps in the middle of the road. So infrastructure, we have to pay attention to it. Uh, the, the, the third one for me is investment. Investment. I know, I know, I know that leaders will say all oh, this cannot be done without security. But investment is important because mm -hmm. we 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 are we are a young country. Mm -hmm. How do we now? First of all, investment will create more opportunities for the country, but also give us a different face and outlook. And I think uh, how we guard that that and we need to strengthen how that is done. How we guard that particular institution is important because it will define what you're going that looks like in the years to come. What are your parting shots? My parting shots. <laughs> we talked about so many things today. Yes. <laughs> I'm really not sure. My heart is tugged on democracy and dictatorship. It is, <laughs> it is okay. <laughs> but 
Well, I think the topic uh, is leadership and governance. Mm-hmm. And I think for us as a country, leadership is leadership is land, leadership is also in born. There has to be a deliberate effort in how we are training leaders to become better leaders. Mm-hmm. There has to be a deliberate effort in how we are working to make our society suitable for us as the younger generation. I'm still claiming to be in the younger generation. <laughs> us as the younger generation mm-hmm. and then for the generation that is coming because we're going to leave them. Let's give people a country that they would be proud to be associated with. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. What are your parting shots? I, about leadership, I think we need to do more of mentorship today because there are lots of things that are falling apart because we have not groomed or mentored people to do exactly what they're supposed to be doing with the different positions they hold. So in order to offer meaningful leadership, I think we need to impact on the lives of people positively so that they can also grow to become leaders in this country. Thank you. And thank you so much, Dr. Patricia. Thank you so much, Dana. And thank you so much, you, our viewer. It's a pleasure having had you watching. Uh, there is something that uh, Dana raised which is very important. There is, there is need to review our education system. Uh, we are glad that NCDC has come up with a new lower secondary school curriculum, but we pray that it uh, it really answers most of these questions because it also has a lot of issues. And uh, we pray that uh, there will be a time where we embrace what is really uh, looking at and uh, tackling what concerns us and not what is imported from elsewhere. Thank you so much, everyone else in Alaziz. I've worked with Linda Dina uh, on camera, Jonah Jow, the producer, and in transmission, there is Didimas Kalemwa. God bless you. Until we meet again next time.